I am very, very proud and very honoured to welcome you all to this event today. Um, I suppose in terms of today's event, we could call it the launching of a movement. It's a really exciting event that we are very, very grateful and proud that you've all leaned into and you're all now here and part of. Um, in terms of today, firstly, I should probably say this is a bit of a new world for me personally. So my own background is the world of education. So I was a teacher for many years. Forgive me if I use a teacher voice today and ask any of you to be quiet. That might happen. Apologies in advance. Um, and yeah, now I work in the world of transformation in local government. So I'm very, very excited to be part of this day. Um, I do know that this is quite a kind of technical and niche area for us to be discussing today. But really, the kind of heart of what's going to go through what we're going to be talking about is the future of the world. And that is something that affects all of us and something I'm particularly passionate about and excited to be part of today. Before we begin, uh, in terms of setting up the tone of the day, I'm going to ask you to indulge me in an activity. Like I said, I was a teacher, so I'm probably going to do this sort of thing. Forgive me. Um, so if you could take a moment, it might be best if you close your eyes. If you're not comfortable closing your eyes, you might want to just have a sort of hazy gaze, look into the distance, kind of sleepy eyes. That might help as well. Um, so I want you all to imagine your 50 years in the future. And if you can't imagine yourself 50 years in the future, imagine someone you love, someone you know and that you care about, and they're there 50 years in the future. You're in a room and you're sat down on a chair. You look out the window of that room and you gaze into the distance. I want you to imagine the world that you're looking at. What can you see far away from your window? I'd like you to look to the left of your window. What's out on that side? Is there anything different that you can see? And now look to the right. What else is there in the world outside the room you're in? And you slowly get up from your chair. You leave your room, whatever room that is, and you walk out the front door of the building you've put yourself in. You turn your head left and right and you look down that road. You see other things there, other people. You take yourself on a journey from that road outside that front door to the local high street. And you take a moment to look up and see the different buildings that are there the different people that are there, the different things that are there that might not be people. So you're having a look around, um, but the sun is setting and the day is coming towards an end. So you're going to take yourself back to your front door, that door you left um, a few hours ago. You walk back in, you take yourself somewhere comfortable and you sit back down to have your evening. Okay, you can open your eyes, kind of refocus. Um, so hopefully for a few moments, you were transported to a bit of a different world. You were somewhere else. Um, and that is the future. That's the space that we're going to be thinking and talking about today. And that is the world that we're building towards. Um, and that is what today is about, essentially. It's what is that world that you created in your mind? What did you see? What did you want to be there? And how can we play a role in building towards that world? OK. Right, I'm very, very honoured to be introducing our first speaker. OK, so first up, we have Jesse Williams. So he is an incredible young person, a social sector leader who's already achieved so much. So he's still studying to become a barrister. But while studying, he's also the co-founder and chair of Rekindle School, an amazing charity um, doing amazing things for young people. So I'm going to ask Jesse, would you come up to the stage and give us our first keynote speech? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to start today by doing something that, believe me, I truly hate. And that's <laughs> talking a bit about me. So I grew up in Hackney, East London, 
it was a very traditionally working class area. Um, it was the sort of thing where, uh, you know, social activities, it wasn't going to the cinema or going out for a meal. It was playing football in the local park because it's free. Um, and we were more likely to get three pieces of chicken and chips than we were to get, you know, a nice little posh restaurant. And the school I went is called Carnival. So it's a local school, local comprehensive. And it was the sort of school that you hear about in the news. You know, like teachers were more focused on keeping the class under control than they were able to actually focus on teaching. I could tell you so many stories that will probably make your eyes water, but that's not the purpose of today. It will be relevant in a second why I've mentioned this, but a bit more about me. So I grew up with my three brothers, four sisters, and two parents in a three-bed flat. So how did I get from there to where I am now? Well, a few of my achievements, which again, believe me, I do hate to say, but a few of my achievements. So when I was younger, so whilst I was 14, I joined the Hackney Youth Parliament and led campaigns on things like respect and police communications. I was part of the Legacy Youth Voice, which the London Legacy Development Corporation, which manages the Olympic Park in Stratford. I was one of their youth board members who influenced how the local community will be able to benefit from it. As I grew up, I went on to study law, which I graduated. Um, but whilst I was there, I was chair of the Lancaster University Miscarriages of Justice Project. So I was responsible for working with prisoners who had failed appeals and trying to get them one last shot because they maintained that they were innocent. I did a master's, which I got a full scholarship for and graduated with distinction. And I was listed as one of the top 50 black students in the UK. There's other stuff I could do, but I'm really bored of my own voice and hearing about me. So I'm going to move on at this point. I came from a working class background, in a working class area, tough school, tough environment. I achieved all that. So everything's good, right? What you don't see in the externals of what I've achieved is what enabled me to get there. So actually, although I went to school in a working class area, and I worked in a working class area, both of my parents immigrated from Nigeria, where they were both very middle class. And so actually, I had cultural capital that many of my classmates didn't have. Both of my parents gave up their jobs to look after us. So my mom was an accountant, my dad ran a factory. They gave it up to make sure that they could keep an eye on us and make sure we weren't doing the wrong things after school. Again, many of my friends didn't have that. And in spite of everything my parents did, I still nearly went down the wrong path. And then I was this close to being kicked out of school. And Sometimes it keeps me up at night thinking about what might have happened if I didn't have those two teachers who supported me and made sure I stayed in. But even with that, it was only the intervention of organizations like Debate Mate, where I learned to get my frustrations out in a positive manner. Charities like the Amos Bursary, which put together a personal and professional development package that I benefited from. Things like the Hatton Youth Parliament. Without them, I would have gone down a very different path. And I mention that because why are we in this room today? We're in this room to think about what is it, why is it that so many working class young people are failing? Why is so many in society being left behind and what can we do to change that? And so I mentioned that I had a very different experience from some of my friends. I'll mention some of them to you. Because many of them, they had parents who were working two or three jobs just to put food on the table. Their parents weren't able to be there for them when they got back home. They weren't able to make sure they weren't doing the wrong thing. And a lot of them found solace in gangs. I had parents, uh, friends who ended up selling drugs because their parents, despite their hard work, just literally could not afford to put food on the table or pay the rent. I don't say this to bring the mood down, I say it because this is the reality of so many people in our society. And all of this took place before any of these friends were teenagers. What we're doing is the way we've set up in society, the way the system is set up, it means that inevitably for some to be 
to succeed, others fail. And the purpose of this conference, in my view, the reason why we're here is to say, how can we reshape that? How can we make sure that as people are thriving, those at the bottom of the chain aren't left behind? And again, I mentioned that there were so many positive things I benefited from, so many third sector organizations. And yes, they're good for someone like me who's studious and was encouraged to get involved. But I think the purpose of the day truly is to think about what about those who couldn't get one of the 20 places on Hackney Youth Parliament, who couldn't get one of the 15 places on the Amos Bursary. And fundamentally, we took a second just now to think about what we want for our vision of the future. I'm sure none of you had in that an 11 year old having their life choices limited. So I'll wrap up by saying this, if we really want to change that, if we really want to make sure that we're not leaving people behind in society like this, it starts not just by doing something, donating to a charity or doing a good cause, which obviously is a very good thing. But if we want to capture everyone, it starts by rethinking how we shape our systems. It's how do we use the leverages and resources that we have right now to make a change. It doesn't happen by waiting till we get that promotion or we're in that position to change things because there's always a reason not to do it. So as we continue with the rest of this conference, I implore you to think, what can I do in my organization? What can I do with my personal time? What can I do to make sure we redesign the way we operate so that no one is left behind? Thank you.